Hello, I'm David Bradbury. Welcome to Greenland and the story of the Vinland map. This is a story about trust and trustworthiness. Therefore, I shall be doing my best to make you mistrust me, while always presenting evidence to help you make up your own mind. Please let me know in the comments if you spot any definite mistakes. One thing I can guarantee is true, because I didn't discover it, is that the Vinland map is a fake as I'll explain briefly in part six. The known history of the Vinland map begins around spring 1957, when Enzo Ferraioli de Ri, an Italian dealer in old books and manuscripts then living in Spain, began showing the volume containing the map and the associated, seemingly also unique, manuscripts called the Historia Tartarorum to other dealers. That summer, London bookseller Irving Davis accompanied him to the British Museum to seek some expert opinions. But see what happened when they got there. The Department of Manuscripts was just to the right of the museum entrance, but Davis kept going straight on. His destination was apparently the map room, upstairs at the rear of the building. Yet somehow, the first museum expert to see the Vinland map was George Painter, looking after early printed books out here in the Arched Library. I suspect that Davis went to Painter, who had worked in the Department of Printed Books for nearly 20 years, because he knew that the volume would intrigue him. Peter Skelton, superintendent of the Printed Maps collection, was also fascinated when he saw the Binland map, but as a manuscript it was outside his area of responsibility. So it was sent where Davis should have gone in the first place. Bertram Schofield, the museum's keeper of manuscripts, swiftly dismissed the map as a fake, probably 19th century or later. At this point, I need to introduce a new word, Vickispiracy. In September, at Nicholas Rauch's bookshop in Geneva, Enzo Ferraioli met a young American book dealer, Lawrence Witten, who had recognised, following military service in Europe, that there would be many antiquarian bargains available for exports to America in the harsh years after the Second World War. Ferraioli showed Witten the map volume, candidly admitting that its authenticity was in doubt, but apparently insisting that it had come from a very respectable private collection. They agreed a price of $3,500. That would be acceptable even if the Historia Tartarorum alone could be proved genuine, and a sale was made, technically by Rausch. Ferraioli then recommended Witten to contact Davis, who was also hunting for bargains in Italy, and the two met up in Milan. I suspect that the conversation turned, perhaps quite innocently on Witten's part, to customers they might have in common. The next development in the plot may also have been the result of casual hints by Ferraioli or Davis. Returning home to New Haven, Connecticut, Witten's library research confirmed the reality of the epic medieval journey described in the Historia Tartarorum, and identified the source of the Vinland map's depiction of the Old World as a map drawn in 1436 by Italian navigator Andrea Bianco, photographs of which had been published in the 19th century. In October, he visited Yale University Library to seek some expert opinions. He consulted his friend Thomas Marston, specialist in early printed books, who also shared Witten's interest in medieval manuscripts, and Alexander Vitor, the map librarian, apparently telling them that he had bought the volume on a visit in company with Ferrioli to the private library in which it had been held. The main concern they expressed was that the map and the Historia Tartarorum, although on parchment of the same size, did not seem to belong together because the bookworm holes through the map did not match the single hole through the text. Witten decided not to attempt to sell the volume and gave it to his wife. In April 1958, Thomas Marston was lucky enough to be one of the recipients of an advance copy of the latest catalogue of old books and manuscripts from Irving Davis. There were numerous tempting bargains, but he noticed that one manuscript was particularly good value for a collector who, like him, was attempting to recreate a medieval scholar's library. He added it to his purchase requests and was amused to learn, much later, 
that an American expert on Vincent de Bove had received the same catalogue just too late to beat him. Lawrence Witten reported similarly that he did not receive a copy of the catalogue until May or June, though Cambridge University, which had copies of the Speculum Historiale bought as new centuries ago, did make a different purchase from the same catalogue on 10th April. On behalf of an academic researcher, Lawrence Witten had asked Marston to let him know about any books he bought in original medieval bindings, and the speculum fitted the bill, apart from some recent repair work which included new end papers. Spotting quickly that the pages were about the same size as his Vinland map volume, and with the same unusual mixture of paper and parchment, he asked Marston to let him take the book for comparison. Everything matched, from the watermarks in the paper to the wormholes, which showed that the map had formerly been at the front and the Historia Tartarorum at the back. When he showed his friend what he had learned, Marston recognised that the two volumes had to be together, so he gallantly donated the speculum to Mrs Witten on the understanding that Yale University Library would have first refusal if she and her husband decided to sell them. Lawrence began further research on the map and the two texts. Witten met Ferry early again on his 1958 European shopping expedition, and perhaps the conversation turned to the possibility that the text and map had been created in association with the Council of Basel, a lengthy international conference of Catholic Church dignitaries in the 1430s, very close to the circa 1450 date Davis had suggested for the speculum volume. Certainly, that October, Witten, claiming that he had fruitlessly revisited the library from which he had bought the map, was able to complete his detailed report on the Vinland map and its associated texts. And the following spring, after some further work suggested by Vita and Marston, he and Mrs. Witten offered them to Yale University Library at a price of some $300,000. Yale took up the Vicky Spiracy baton and ran with it. Consulting lists of potential benefactors, they identified the very limited number for whom a charitable donation worth $300,000 would be less than 30% of their annual income and therefore tax deductible in full. The name of the eventual purchaser was not revealed until decades later. Paul Mellon, whose share of his late father's estate was worth at least half a billion dollars, giving him an annual income of at least $10 million, even if it was invested at a puny 2% interest. The agreement, also not revealed for decades, was that he would buy the map and have it independently authenticated before donating it to Yale. That would enable Mellon to obtain a new valuation and claim tax relief on that figure rather than the purchase price. Brilliantly, the potential importance of the map as the earliest cartographic record of America was used as an excuse to keep the authentication process secret and to involve only experts who were already aware of its existence. Even more brilliantly, the process of authentication was turned into the process of writing a scholarly book about the map and the Historia Tartarorum to be published by Yale University Press with sponsorship from Mellon. Presumably on advice from Witten, in conjunction with Ferrioli, Peter Skelton of the British Museum was invited to contribute to the main essay on the map, while Thomas Marston was asked to undertake the translation of the text and Alexander Vito was to supervise the work. Marston found his knowledge of Latin was inadequate, so George Painter was brought in for the translation and Marston confined himself to description of the manuscript and its probable history. Of all the four, it seems likely that only Vita understood that the primary purpose of the project was authentication for tax purposes. Although Mellon bought the map from Witten in August 1959, Skelton did not get the chance to see it until he visited America in February 1961, when he spent some weeks studying it and befriended Witten, who subsequently sent him further helpful suggestions to supplement his detailed 1958 report, on which Skelton relied heavily in his work. Lawrence Witten did not admit until 1974 that he had paid rather more than $3,500 for the Vinland map because he had also given Ferrioli and Rausch a percentage of the money he got from Mellon. In fact, he had in 1966 gone to the length of inviting inspection of his accounts 
to show that no such payment had been made. What we do know, however, is that Witten continued to buy items from Ferry Early through Rausch for several years after 1957, and it is possible that the prices of these purchases were inflated so that they helped to pay off the debt. Numerous items from Ferry Early and other European dealers were sold to Marston, greatly increasing the scope of his scholarly manuscript collection. However, the purchases were abruptly halted in March 1961 by the arrest of Ferraioli on multiple charges of theft from the Cathedral Library of Zaragoza in Spain in conspiracy with library staff. This created a serious problem for Witten because, although he could be quite sure the Vinland map would have been very well known if it had belonged to the Cathedral Library rather than a private collection, he could not be at all sure about the many modestly priced items he had sold to Marston, on whose goodwill the authentication process was now somewhat reliant. Therefore, it was probably on Witten's advice that Thomas Marston wrote to his employers, Yale University Library, on 1st May, offering to sell them the bulk of his collection, an offer they accepted later that year. This was in the nick of time because, although Ferraioli's confederates had apparently destroyed the relevant library catalogue entries when they sold him the books and manuscripts, it turned out that, decades earlier, a local historian had compiled for his own use a list of all items in the library dated between 1501 and 1753, which was soon published in Zaragoza for worldwide circulation. As it turned out, both some items from the Marston collection and others which Witten had sold directly to Yale were stolen from Zaragoza, but Yale and other major institutions like the British Museum simply stated that they had bought the items in good faith and the booksellers claimed that they had bought in good faith from Ferrioli. Witten, by now a family friend, went further and attempted to show, based on what little of Ferrioli's paperwork had not been confiscated by the Spanish police, that Ferraioli himself had bought in good faith from the cathedral library. Other evidence suggested this was not the case, and guilty verdicts were returned when the case came to trial in 1964, in semi-secrecy because of the church involvement, but the outcome was reported in detail by the Spanish press, and by British journalist Anne Taylor in the London Observer. The prison sentences were postponed pending appeal. The Vinland map book slash authentication had largely been finished by February 1963, and it was announced as an upcoming project to the board of Yale University Press, but various unfortunate circumstances delayed it. 1964 was a year of interesting government actions. Following the announcement of the discovery by Helga and Anne Steiner Ingstad of a Norse settlement on Newfoundland, President Johnson declared a Leif Eriksson Day to be celebrated a few days before Columbus Day. More significantly, for the first time in decades, the top rate of income tax was reduced from a massive 91% to 77%, with a further reduction to 70% slated for 1965. Overall, that was good news for Paul Mellon, but in terms of the Vinland map investment, it was awkward. At a tax rate of 91%, if he could obtain a new valuation of $340,000 or above, he would recoup from the inland revenue the whole purchase price plus the cost of authentication. At 77% tax, he would need a valuation of $400,000, and at 70% that would rise to $440,000. In autumn 1964, the galley proofs for the Vinland map book were delivered. Alexander Vita's introduction includes the carefully worded statement that the team behind the book are satisfied that the evidence, while in part circumstantial and not amounting to legal proof, justifies them in affirming without reservation the genuineness of the manuscript. Presumably Paul Mellon got a copy, for in December, just in time to avoid the fall to 70% tax rate, he finally donated the two precious volumes to Yale University Library. One condition of the donation was that he should be anonymous, so Tom Marston and Alec Vita had to go through the book proofs removing all mention of his name. Claims that the map was then worth a million dollars may well be exaggerated, but certainly later insurance valuations suggest that it had been valued at over $700,000, which would mean that Mellon would effectively receive well over half a million dollars from American taxpayers, gaining him at least $200,000 more than he had invested.